Welcome back. Coffee and tea are strong forces of nature, aren't they? I don't know how many of you that live in Sweden or, or have worked a lot in Sweden. Having come back after many years outside, I realized how religiously we Swedes drink coffee. I don't know in the castle, Your Majesty, if you're also like that. If you don't get coffee at 10, no. <laughs> What, no water, no coffee in the, in the, in, uh, in the castle. No, it's um, good to have you back. I know it's difficult to draw yourself from the discussions outside. There are always interesting discussions. There are new people to meet, networks to join, and solutions to uh, come up with. Well, welcome back. For you, so you who joined us uh, as new participants, um, they're not just random people sitting up here. Uh, we've had uh, short interventions from, from all of our distinguished panelists. Uh, in the first session uh, of today, where we've gotten the global context from uh, Johan, we got the farmer and the efficient use of, of uh, water in agriculture from Colin, we've got Rita looking at the human health aspect, Tony looking at FAO's new uh, acronym, I'm not so sure if the uh, people in Rome are going to be happy with that, uh, but looking at uh, accounting systems and, and responsibilities and trade and trade-offs. Uh, and of course, Paul from uh, representing Nestle uh, from the business perspective of, of what you can actually do uh, both upstream within the walls and downstream um, to help reduce the water use. Well, now we've come to the part where you guys have to wake up and be interactive. So I'm hoping you've had extra uh, uh, cups of coffee. Uh, we want to have an interaction dis interactive discussion, we want you to, to pose challenging questions, come with, with comments and also interact in if you feel that you have some of the answers to questions being posed, so don't be shy. And again, we've heard farmers, you are the most important people, so do raise your voices. Um, well, I'll start off, I'll kick off so you don't feel shy. I'll kick off with a few questions to, to each and every one of our panelists so you can still think and, and, and uh, vocabulize your questions. Johan, you, I think you were wrongly accused of being the pessimist a little bit uh, in the beginning of really kind of putting the global stage here. But you talked about humanity entering the um, Anthropocene, oh, I can't even say it. Uh, Anthropocene, uh, so that we have actually become a geological force of change. So what needs to be done on a global level for us to not to be a destructive force, but maybe a more constructive force? To begin with, oh, I begin with I, I'll be taking with me from this panel, um, and I'll always be citing you, Paul, that a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. So that, <laughs> that is, that's my new, I'll put that in the backside of my business card. Um, <laughs> So, um, so, so problem solved. Uh, now, <clears throat> the, the Anthropocene is, is of course, you, 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 could, you could translate it to be the most gloomy message to humanity, of course. I mean, it tells us that we are surpassing the, the natural changes on planet Earth. And, and not only is it dramatic in terms of the fact that we are changing the entire planet, uh, you see, it means that we might be going away from the geological era that we all learned in school that we're in, the Holocene. And the Holocene happens to be this remarkably stable Eden's garden the last 10,000 years, you know, when the geological cycle was predictable and ecosystems were all in place and temperature varied by plus minus one degree. So it is, there's, there are big things at stake. But the optimistic story, the way to translate that is one is that it's an anthropocentric story. We humans are, are part of nature and therefore also in the driving seat. And we're the first generation to know that we're facing this challenge. I think the story that goes through the entire panel here is that what we then need to configure in our brain is that business as usual and tinkering at the margins is not the solution. We need to think of transformative options for change, and so many of them are there. We can envisage a low-carbon economy in the future. We can envisage sustainable intensification of our cultural systems. We can envisage supplying fresh water for growing world population if we use water more efficiently, reducing waste, etc. So I think it's more about configuring our perceptions, about a mind shift, and with that mind shift we can release a lot of good positive energy. So who are the most important people to target with this new information and, and advocacy? Is it politicians? Well, you, you, and you, you may not know this, but I'm, I'm an agronomist, so I'm, on the, I'm in the farmer's camp. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. so I mean, but, but you know, I think we need co-design, uh, and that's, I think, one of the most important new exciting things that we need, and, and Rita pointed that out as well. I mean, to, to put 
and, and, and Colin as well, to put science with practitioners, with policy and business in new partnerships to co-design positive strategies. I don't think we can single out one actor. We need a co-design together. And those coalitions are being built up. Just go out and Hall B here and the Nexus work, for example. So I think a lot of new alliances are being built. You're leaving us with an optimistic note. Um, well, uh, let's jump a little bit. Rita, uh, you talked about the human health aspects and, and that the fact that diarrheal disease is one of the most important issues that we have to deal with out there, and that actually that 50% of the under-5 malnutrition is resulting from, from uh, poor water uh, sources and, and poor sanitation. Well, so is it actually a, a, you know, a, a food production distribution problem, or would you rather see that we have to deal with the water and sanitation issues as well to kind of deal with this issue as a, as a whole? Well, I think the uh, prime example, unfortunately, is Haiti. Uh, there is a country that, with proper safe water and sanitation, could be transformed. Uh, without that, the country just can't function. And in fact, I think uh, it's proven to be very interesting scientifically because the studies we've done and just recently published show that contrary to the challenge that uh, it was imported cholera, we find that actually there are several strains of infectious agents, uh, the non-cholera as well as the cholera and other bacteria that are contributing to that massive epidemic where hundreds of thousands of people have died. And it's also an example of the relationship of human infectious diseases with, in this case, too much water when you have monsoons, rains, flooding, and then the water distribution systems become heavily contaminated. So we are very much linked, and I think how we carry out agriculture is very important. The wastes that uh, normally come up with just production need to be, I think, um, utilized, as we were discussing uh, in the coffee break, utilized as a source of energy. And I think um, our Nestle representative pointed out extremely well that you can actually, in the case of a cow, trap the methane and generate energy. So we need to have integrated systems, and we need, of course, primarily safe water and sanitation. That, that I think, is the, the key driver. So, Colin, I mean, agriculture is, is I think, is the, isn't that the, um, the oldest um, occupation? So we've been doing this for, you know, since millennia, and, and there are early signs when we start digging out the, the earth in archaeological sites of dams and, and, and uh, streams of, of irrigation. So why, you know, of all these years, why haven't we come up, why haven't we learned, why are we in this stage now? Shouldn't that, all that knowledge that we've had through thousands and thousands of years help us today and guide us? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, food production is intimately linked with demand and, and population growth. And whereas uh, for literally millennia, we sort of moved from one, one billion to, to two billion, three billion sort of... Uh, in the middle of the last century, we're now at seven and we're going, going to nine. So the, the pressure is really on. And I think one thing that is, we should remember is that uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, we, we thought we were all going to face uh, a very uncertain food, food future. And uh, we invented, uh, or we developed what was called the Green Revolution. That had a tremendous impact on uh, food production. Uh, some people say Norman Bollard, the father of the Green Revolution, saved one billion people from uh, starvation. But he, men and women have very short memories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've mentioned the Green Revolution to uh, a younger generation uh, on several occasions recently, and they look blank. And if they think of anything, they think it's something to do with eco-efficiency. And I think Paul touched on this as well. Uh, we, we solved the problems, we produced a lot of food, uh, food did not become a, a ma major issue, and then suddenly we're faced with the food crisis in 2007-2008, uh, and, uh, and one of the reasons, uh, we took our eye off the bull, we, we've, we reduced funding going into R&D in agriculture, and it's, it's very, very low, as was said, it's now, it's now stepping up. I think the next challenge is to actually produce 
the food for everybody, which I say, which I think is possible. But I think the other side of the coin is that we have to also focus on making sure that diets are nutritious. And one thing that's been brought brought home to me very clearly, living in South Asia, and to some extent uh, seeing the same thing in Africa, is that uh, so many pe people are condemned to uh, a life in which their physical and intellectual uh, ca capacity or potential is not met because of very poor nutrition uh, in the womb and in the first three, four, five years of life. So I think what we have to think about this time around is not only filling our bellies, but making sure that uh, the food we eat is, is highly nutritious. So that's uh, as for us as consumers, I guess, as well. So Paul, how, you know, what kind of influence uh, do the consumers have, uh, do you think, as a, you know, from a business perspective? How much do you listen to them? You have your networks and forum, and of course, you see what people buy and don't. But how could you influence this change in, in diet and be a, you know, maybe a positive force of change? Well, if you see consumers as the commercial link, that's one thing. Consumers are also public, so they have opinions, and uh, that's two dimensions we have to look at, but um, coming back on the consumers, and the consumers are uh, in food, they're very local. There is no such thing as a global consumer, so you have to really localize this whole dimension. And that comes back then to nutritionist food, because we speak about food security as enough food. It is actually not only quantity, it is also the quality of food, and that links up again to uh, hygiene, etc. And, and, and then you go to the developing world and the micronutrients, and then you see the effect of uh, if you have healthier um, uh, childhood, how the productivity of a country explodes, really goes up. And then, again, uh, more productive farming is, 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 again, part of the solution. So it's a virtual circle. We as a company, we, we actually, uh, the consumer is guiding us in these dimensions. We check always our products. We have a system that we check our products um, Basically, we churn our products every five, six years, all our products, with two criteria. First, it has to taste well, because we know also healthy diets are only there when people like it. It's, it's, it's a fallacy thinking that you can force nutritional food, even if it, it should taste first. So that's the first thing we test on. We have to taste the best. Second is nutritional dimensions to it. Uh, so we have to have a plus, a nutritional plus. So more, um, more goodies, less baddies, if you want to simplify it. Uh, and de facto, we're selling 1.2 billion uh, products a day. And, and many of them are potential carriers of micronutrients. Micronutrients are no, not costly. So you can actually use the, the physical presence of our companies over there to be part of that. So, um, so consumers, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, there is a permanent interaction. Then consumers as part of the public, I do believe too, awareness, I spoke about that in my, in my introductory words. Awareness in my eyes is very important. Education too. So we are interlinking with our consumers on education too, on food, diets, and et cetera, because also we don't see there's unhealthy food, there is unhealthy diets, and diets are linked with knowledge. And education, I think personally, I was never educated one hour on nutrition when I was at school. Now that starts to fade in. I do believe government should do much more instead of uh, uh, pointing fingers and all that. They should really assume that educational, we can be part of that through transparency and information on our labels, etc. So we are part of that too in that sense. But then also awareness, and I spoke about uh, uh, the, 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 the wrong ideas that we have in the consumer or the public at large. And I spoke about biofuels as an example, but there's so much, it was distortion and emotion about the certain things that facts should uh, neutralize and, and really guide the energy in the right direction. And uh, so that's uh, why we also communicate a lot about, uh, about water. We actually have a way of thinking as a company that uh, to be successful as a company, you can only be successful over time. And we are a long-term thinking company. You can only be successful if you create success for your company shareholder value if you want, but at the same time in everything you do you have to interact with society at large in a positive way, creating value for society. Uh, so we, create, we call that creating shared value. Um, and it is intrinsically linking our corporate social responsibility with what we do every day. And, and, and there we have three areas, nutrition, we spoke about that, water, because it's so clear, closely linked to our activity, and the rural development. And again, these three are intertwined because rural development is more productivity, and I mentioned it before. And I do believe that's how we interact with our consumers in a permanent way. Yeah.
Thank you. So, Tony, we talked about the consumer and we've talked about agriculture, but you know, let's let's throw in another dimension. Why not? I mean, we've 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 stuck to a few a few dimensions here. I mean, we've seen the the, the um, rising price of, of of food have had several effects on on uh, on the global trade patterns, and land and water has become interesting commodities instead and, and agriculture is you know no longer just seen as 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 a production of food but but also as, as a, a power commodity so what what is this this new dynamic how is it affecting the different societies in our world and the different parts of of the world that we live in um, the price of food is an interesting topic we could spend a long time on that the price of food has been falling for a thousand years uh, certainly for a hundred certainly for definitely for the last 60 we had a price spike in the 70s, energy-related. We had a price spike recently, mainly energy-related, but also with the other financial crisis in the background as well. So this, this, we're not through this, uh, this price spike yet. Um, everyone that wants attention, uh, gain attention, is talking about it going on forever. But I remember those of us who are old enough to remember the 70s, we felt the same in the 70s, and then prices came down again. So we, we've got to live through to the, to the next stage. We have a, a doubled population by now, so that, that will make a difference. So we, we have a world in which we, we are wondering whether we can do it, but Colin, who's an informed optimist, and, and I certainly... <laughs> Um, feel that we, we're going to, if the food side is going to be fine, we're going to have enough food. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to do it. Uh, the stewardship side is going to be more difficult mm -hmm. because that really does require uh, getting people to value water. Um, the way that the private sector will, you know, on its farms and in the uh, trading and um, manufacturing and retailing processes deal with it, uh, would be helped, as I've said, by having some price signals in there which help us to help the farmers to be good stewards as well as good producers, and we need the whole thing to be working well. But the, to re repeat my message, um, we, we need the politics um, in place. We need uh, politicians um, have a rough time in this area. They're trying to please farmers. They're trying to uh, secure food for the people. Uh, in the United States, the process, and there are some Americans here, that, I mean, it's a, a, an extraordinary um, process in the States as in Europe, but the president of, or would-be president of the United States has got to go to Iowa at the beginning of the caucus process and stand up and say to all the farmers there, I will do anything for you for the next four years. <laughs> What? A, that's right. So, the, and that's in the Iowa uh, Constitution, apparently, that no one else can have the first, um, the first caucus because they want to have the first uh, bite at the, at the at the starving man, as it were. Uh, so, the, so that's the level of politics. That, that's the you know this high end of the industrialized production end. At the at the poverty end, uh, such as we've been hearing about mainly from Colin, very importantly, because the, the, the politics are different, but also driven by survival in North America and in Europe at sharp elbows uh, of, of, of farmers, but uh, they can, in fact, be induced to be good stewards uh, and are being in different ways, but it's this process is too slow, so we need the information from the scientists, and the, but it, it needs to be not just lobbed across so that people, perhaps, it's got to be lobbed straight into the farming community and straight into the food supply chain actors so that they can then relay, and then it needs to be straight into the consumers, because the consumers can, in fact, have a very important impact on the private sector food uh, uh, purveyors, the, and, and Walmart, uh, to be fair, is, as, as Paul well knows, uh, and in, in my country, Marks and Spencers and Waitrose and names such as that, are in fact um, uh, leading the way. Uh, I, I'm you know, encouraging them and, 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 uh, and praise them for doing that, but one knows that they're much cleverer um, agents than others in the game, and they're, in, in effect, uh, keeping abreast of the agenda and possibly making the agenda, so they really need to have even more uh, NGO um, uh, encouragement and consumer encouragement to make sure that the pace of recognizing the need for stewardship is in place, but it's a political process via the market. So it's a challenge for all of us to take what we know and, and to make it understandable for, for different audiences and, and go out there and talk about it. So I'm, I'm looking across the room. Yes, please could you just state your name and where you're from so we know who we're talking to. 
as well. A mic, I'm having a mic, and we have, we'll take one, this one first over there, and you're number two. Thank you. You'll come on. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank for the very interesting presentations. Uh, it made this session very exciting. Uh, I would like, to, however, to make a comment referring to one aspect which has been subjacent to some of the interventions, but I believe has not been uh, enough uh, put in evidence. Uh, for instance, Colin mentioned uh, the increase in population, I think uh, two, two or, or more than two billion from now to the middle of the century. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that with the increasing deficiency we have been discussing, we could easily cope. This will not be dramatic, uh, I believe. What's important is that uh, in the same period, from, for instance, from years to the middle of the century, the amount of water spent by a lot of these 9 billion will increase very much because uh, particularly in emerging countries that want to get uh, to reach uh, level standards of living which are similar to, the, uh, to those in the Western countries, uh, the water consumption per, per, per capita will increase tremendously related to food and we always speak to food because food uh, agriculture includes about 70% of the water consumption in the world, but also related to all the other products. Any of other products you can see in, in, in incorporates a lot of virtual water. And so the consumption uh, will increase tremendously. It's not the, 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 for, for, for the satisfying our needs where it's already <coughs> different. We spend two or 300 liters per, per day in the, in the developed countries and 50 in the developing. But uh, for the water incorporated in products is about one or a magnitude higher, it's about 3,000 liters per day. And this is a problem that is not uh, sufficiently put in evidence because if we let go things following business as usual, and it was said that business as usual is not possible, uh, the contability has been done. We would need by the middle of the century about three planets, the water of three planets to, to solve the problem. And uh, that, that's, that's a lot. I mean, water, water is, is a renewable uh, resource, so it's not like oil where we will have a peak oil, which is, has been uh, thought a lot in terms of stock, but we have a peak water in terms of flux. I mean, the, the water that can be renewed every, every year. So if nothing was done, we would come very soon to a situation uh, that will be very difficult, that's an horizon behind which our way of thinking, our models wouldn't work at all. And we don't know exactly what would happen, but we know it will involve a lot of sacrifices to be done. So this, I would like to, to, to hear some comment on this. I would say that uh, I, um, I'm, I didn't say in the beginning, I didn't say what you asked, I'm from Lisbon, I'm a professor at the university, but I have been asked by one foundation in Lisbon, which is Calus School Banking Foundation, that some of you may know, because it's the biggest Portuguese foundation with a lot of activity, not only in the scientific area, but in cultural and educational. And uh, uh, they asked me to, to form a group to think, to make a reflection at a small think tank on the water and the future of humanity. And we will publish a, a book at so the beginning of next year, something like that. There was a meeting here to reflect on this. and. and and this is really a matter of great concern because, particularly because of the urgency. Yeah. This let's, is, let's bring the question this, to the, to the panel and see a comment. Just point one thing. This is not going to happen in 1,000 years if we let it go. Not in 100 of years, but in a matter of a couple of decades. Uh, most of the people are not, have not the awareness of this. So uh, it's a serious problem. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, comments on the raising consumption of water when we all aspire to have lifestyles as we would call it the Stockholm lifestyle maybe taken on, on us. Colin first and Johan. Well a quick response and we, we've heard the figures of uh, we need to feed two billion more people we need to produce 70 percent. Um, Dr. De Silva, uh, Mr. De Silva from FAO said that might be 60 percent more food but to produce uh, that amount of food we're going to need a at least an equivalent uh, increase in water consumption. So the only way I think we can really 
do that is to become much more efficient, much more crop per drop, uh, or, you know, or the, you know, alternatively in terms of sustainable intensification, doubling production off half the area, the, these kind of approaches. I think these are possible, but there are other things we can do and they involve education. I'm not an advocate of telling everyone they've got to become a vegetarian. I mean, I know the king produces cattle and so we put him out of business if, uh, <laughs> if, if we ask everyone to be vegetarian. But there is medical evidence that uh, those of us who do consume, consume med re re red meat over-consume and we can uh, reduce consumption and still have a, a very good li lifestyle. I, I would like to just reflect before I pass it to, to Johan, on, on this issue of how we maintain environmental quality. And something which uh, is always, I always struggle with, we have so many poor smallholder small holder farmers around the developing world. They live from hand to mouth. We can't expect them to become good stewards if they can hardly survive on, and they haven't got enough food to sort of feed their families. But if we can increase wealth in the whole of the food chain, the production chain, so that these people have uh, more money to spare, they can feed themselves, they can educate themselves. We've then seen in a number of societies, they have time and the ability to actually start looking after the environment. I have never met a farmer from the richest to the poorest who is not at, in his mind's uh, eye a good environmental steward, but we've got to give them the, the wherewithal to make sure we can do that. So more crop per drop, more assistance to small farmers to get them out of this poverty trap, and we'll gradually sort of move forward and, and deal with this situation. Johan? Yeah, thanks. I'll also <clears throat> try to be very brief and, and say three things. The first thing, which is th there's no conclusive scientific um, support to what I'll be saying, but there indications enough that I think we should put this on the table to say there are indications that humanity has come to the end of the road when it comes to the strategy of expanding itself towards more food, meaning allowing agriculture to expand on new land. And we've come approaching the end of the road of just increasing food production by withdrawing more water from our river basin. So essentially, you could, you could say the agenda is becoming more simple. We need to increase food production on existing land with roughly the existing amount of water that we're using. So that is, of course, a very dire agenda, if one would simplify at that point. It, it's not you know, correct for all parts of the world, and some parts are more closed than others, but I mean, in general. Well, the conclusion, the, the implications of that is that we need to do exactly what Colin says, increase crop per drop very dramatically. And the beauty is that you know, the, the hockey sticks of pressure goes in one way, but there's another reverse exponential curve, which is a beautiful one, which means that the higher the productivity on a farm, the less water you need per extra ton of food. And it is steepest in the beginning. So the world's low productive smallholder farmers today producing at one, two tons per hectare of a maize or millet or, or, or wheat consume roughly three, four thousand cubic meters per ton. But if they would move up to just three, four tons, which is the very, very possible potential, you would reduce that by a factor two, three. You would go down to one thousand cubic meters per ton. And then it was it just a constant. So on, on, on His Majesty's farm, another increase in yield would not save so much water. But on the African farm, you save tremendous amount of water. So there's, there's this win-win which is there to grasp. My final conclusion is to say that I think this also tells us that the kind of notion of the nation state is, is in a way falling apart. We're, we're just part of one global hydrological cycle, nine billion people. We need to have a new kind of collaborative way of, of, of doing what Tony has always propagated. The kind of virtual water concept has to be a community concept for all inhabitants on Earth. And, and there are places where water will have to be devoted to produce food for places that do not have water, which is, of course, already occurring, but more systematically. Thank you. We had one question. You're holding the mic, and then we have a few others. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Francois Olives. I'm an irrigation specialist at the World Bank. Uh, you don't look too much surprised, which is good. Uh, you could be surprised because, you know, irrigation specialist at the World Bank <laughs> was very much on the list of endangered species <laughs> a decade ago. And actually, not only in the World Bank. In fact, I embraced irrigation 20 years ago, and that's about the time when the International Irrigation Management Institute changed its name for 
International Water Management Institute. And they also shifted their focus to environment and water resources management. Now they are very much coming back to irrigation, which is excellent. Um, but still, I mean, I would like to reflect you know, a little bit on, on what uh, Colin said at the end of his presentation, get uh, policy levers right. Uh, and, you know, asking, OK, but how then? And what do we need? And I would like to challenge a little bit the room about, you know, the way forward. And are we serious as a, as a, a community of practice in the water sector? Uh, you know, uh, just look uh, at the, uh, what it took for water and sanitation to get where it is now. The water and sanitation program gets $40 million per year, you know, to, to get the policy levers right. Basically, uh, uh, in the 90s, we have introduced the concept of integrated resource management, uh, uh, and there is a global uh, water partnership and all sorts of, of, of uh, uh, activities uh, going around. But when you come to irrigation, of course, there's IMI uh, research, but uh, the mandate of IMI uh, uh, as I mean is on research, and I think uh, I mean. We need to, to look at that and, and be, maybe be a bit more serious about uh, irrigation or say agricultural water as a whole. Thank you. So any comments on, on the challenge? Yes, Colin. Tony? A, a very quick one in that um, I don't think Emmy ever took its focus entirely off irrigation, but we, we started to look very much at irrigation in the context of uh, all water allocation issues in, in a basin. But I, I think uh, one thing we had to think about in terms of this irrigation challenge is yes, we have to educate people uh, that we are going to need to increase the productivity of irrigation, and not forgetting that the vast majority of farmers are rain-fed farmers. But the, the paradigm of this has to be done through large or medium-scale schemes with big dams or medium-scale dams, I'm not at all convinced is the right way forward. I was in Ghana recently talking to the Minister of, Agri uh, of Agriculture and the work we've done there shows that there's about 25, the air, 25 times as much land in smallholder irrigation schemes, private schemes with pumps uh, going from groundwater or, or surface diversions as there are large irrigation schemes, as there is land in large irrigation schemes. We have shown uh, in this work we've been doing with the Gates Foundation that we can increase yields for these smallholders with supplementary irrigation uh, between about 70 and 300 percent depending on the crop. Now when you multiply this out through the numbers of smallholders who might be able to take advantage of sustainable irrigation schemes, this is going to have a tremendous impact on the food security of the region and, and of that country. I think as I alluded to in my talk, one thing we need to do if we, if we move down this changing paradigm or changing model is we need to make sure that we have a very, very strong linkage to, uh, to markets. And I think that's very much where the private sector comes in. And I think we need to make very sure that we have the right kind of financial and um, mechanical support in terms of maintenance of the kind of equipment these people need. We're not saying that there isn't a place for large-scale irrigation schemes. There will be, and they'll be very useful. But let's see how we can actually help some of these smaller rain-fed farmers double their income and, and get to the stage that I mentioned, where they have the wherewithal to feed themselves, educate themselves, and become good land stewards. Thank you, Tony. Some more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Irrigation is good if it's reg it regulated. Um, when, wherever you irrigate, you always run out of water, always. Even in my small country, where we irrigate about 2%, uh, the places where we run out of water is where we irrigate. Um, so in the, the FAO, the farmers save the world, the accountants save the world, and optimism is going to save the world. You notice that accountancy comes before optimism. In other words, we've got to have a, a system in place which values the water. So the irrigation engineers that want to come back in and you know, spread the good news and provide, a good, so provide the practice of irrigation must be, in fact, provide good practice. And that isn't just um, technology. It is you know, how much water is it safe to take out because 
Green water has, and this is just a quick way of putting it, but um, uh, green water looks after itself. Uh, last year's water isn't there and next year's water is not there, so you can only use this year's water, which makes it tough, and it would be nice if there was some supplementary irrigation. But wherever you have irrigation, you can always use last year's water if it's been stored by you or the gods or uh, in, a, in a natural uh, system, or even two years ago, if you're lucky, and you've got two years of storage, you'll, but you'll certainly use next year's and the year after's in a, in a drought, uh, or in a, in a multi-year drought. And that's what happens the world over. And it's mega. It's California, it's North Texas, it's China, it's Punjab, and everywhere. So, yep, irrigation, but the irrigators, irrigation engineers must be taught as part of their final or early uh, education that it isn't just sharing the technology, it's making sure the accounting rules are in place before it goes in, if possible, because otherwise there'll be no stewardship. I have to add the uh, comment that um, we have found, particularly in Bangladesh and India, that the surface waters have become very contaminated. And so as the water for irrigation goes into the shallower wells, those too have become contaminated. And we pick up many of the disease agents there, which led, of course, to even deeper drilling. And then the arsenic situation arose, yeah, particularly in the Ganja area of India and Bangladesh. So. Uh, the safety of the water needs to be considered in agriculture. It's key, and it's usually the last thing thought about, but it's very important. So you threw out a challenge and you got a few back. Uh, yes, we have one here, and then we have Barbara. Yes, mic there to gentleman in the middle. Thanks. My name is Patrick Keyes, and I'm with the Stockholm Resilience Center. And um, I wrote this out so that I wouldn't go too long. There's been a lot of discussion about how food production systems operate in a distorted market. Uh, several people have pointed out that the market needs to allocate food more efficiently and to reduce waste, but cannot do so without a signal of the scarcity of its most valuable input, water. Acknowledging that it will, be, it will inevitably be a challenge from the human rights perspective, should irrigation water be priced at a non-trivial amount to help manage water, yes or no, and why? Maybe we'll come back to you from the World Bank there to, to a comment on, the, on that issue, but we'll let our, our panelists uh, have a go at it, whoever dares to. A very, very short answer on that, uh, because there's a difference between valuing and pricing. Um, and actually in South Africa, we have a system that uh, for the basic needs, there is no price that to be paid by the, by, by, by the less uh, fortunate people. Um, but then to, to, uh, if you have to fill your swimming pool, uh, should it be priced? And then everybody says yes. If you have to have your golf course green in the desert, everybody says yes. So it is not just one answer. I do believe uh, you speak about uh, human rights, you speak then, and, and, and when it is about these basics, then should it have a price? When people don't have money, it should not have a price, but it should be valued. And then actually there is an irony. In very many developing countries, the better affluent part of the society do have running water and all that, very, very, very cheap. And then the poor people, they have then to pay these uh, delivered water 10, 20 times more. For them, it has a price. And it has an extremely high value. That's why they pay for it. But uh, So we, have, we should take the distortions out of the system by valuing it. And, and then you see agriculture, 70% of the fresh water usage and... And in many parts, even in Europe, uh, the southern part of, of, of Spain, I mentioned that, uh, uh, it's not priced. They pay something like, it's calculated 2% of the intrinsic cost. They're not even paying the cost to bring the water there. It's not even the water per se, but the cost to bring it there is subsidized. Um, then you start to wonder, and then you have, you have a point there. But there is a difference between value and price. Tony? Uh, you're always talking about something which... I now call non-food water. I used to call it small water, but it's, it's small sounds unimportant, but it's very important water, it's crucial water. But the non-food water is a different um, problem from the food water, food water, the 90% in the food supply chain. The answer to your question is yes, and then you say, well, come on. Um, but this, that's you know, economics 101, yes. Uh, the, uh, we, we don't live in economies, we live in political economies. And therefore, 
as I tried to point out, when society faced getting labor wrong 200 years ago, it was a 50 year before 1800 and 50 year after 1800 before, even then we hadn't got it right, but we'd got it much better. So there are many generations will be involved. So we're embarking on, and since 1980 certainly, I would say from about 1980, we're embarking on this second, trying to cope with the second failure in which we need to be good stewards of the environment. And putting that in place is, you know, the first 10 steps are political, and they mainly involve f uh, farmers and politicians, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Society needs to understand that, that and we need to help farmers and politicians do it, because politicians, you know, they don't have any, many degrees of freedom. They survive. They are used to dealing with uncertainty and getting by, and we have to love them because they deal with uncertainty. Um, other people don't. Scientists just deal with probability, which is easy peasy. They really deal with big issues, and the you know, sharp elbowed farmers or the millions of poor farmers, and so we've got to help them. Uh, they've got to be. Uh, and that's partly an informational thing. So the, just as getting rid of slavery was a multifaceted issue, it, there were people campaigned, there were the equivalent of NGOs doing whatever they did at that time, and then there were eventually pricing of labor and other things came into place, and it's got better. It's still, we're still struggling with it, and it'll be the same and in 50 years' time when we're struggling with still trying to get the stewardship of water in place. Johan and Colin wanted to comment. Yeah, it's, it's a compliment to Tony, really. I mean, the, the, the reason why it doesn't work, and therefore I'm, I'm very critical to the whole era when we thought that we would solve all water problems by just considering it as an economic good, is, is because the liquid water which goes to the urban non-food supply can be managed priced, even though it has these perverse social impacts. Water for food which is still liquid could possibly, but not very efficiently, but you know, the bulk of the water is, is vapor flows and rain for agriculture. So then you must ask yourself, who owns the rain? And how would you price rainfall on a market? And moreover, we've, we've for the first time in, in human history, come to a point that not only do we have to manage the rain we get, we need to sustain the rain we want. So who is going to pay for the management of landscapes so that you sustain next year's rainfall? which means keeping diverse landscapes in place to get your moisture feedback in place. So I think we're in a position now where we need, in, in that wise stewardship, we need regulated decisions to support wise management. And that price on a market will simply not suffice. I, I would say in the uh, developed world, the answer is probably yes. And I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the, um, the situation in the Murray-Darling Basin where water rights were separated from land rights and therefore water could be traded. And we saw a tremendous move of uh, water from low value use to high value use, uh, low, low value grazing to horticulture, viticulture. But what this has allowed as well is that the government, because there was over allocation, and Tony, it wasn't the engineers or the scientists, it was the politicians who over allocated in Australia by giving largesse to sort of uh, rural communities. So, uh, but what has happened there now is that the government is coming back into the market to buy environmental water to sort of recover some of the lost ground in the environment. So I think that's a good, a good model in a developed society. In a developing country, uh, I think an irrigation services fee uh, for, for modest users is important. It starts to farmers to think about the, the real value of that water and how they can improve its use and get get more out of it. But as a basic human right, probably no, except uh, as Rita showed, uh, if people see there is some intrinsic uh, price to it, they value it more, and this means we may get better health outcomes. Certainly water from the river, untreated is free, but it's certainly very dangerous, at least in many uh, countries. So safe water has to be produced and it does have a value that has to be priced and the price is simply to recoup the cost for providing the safe water. I think that is a fundamental principle. Tony, do you want to add to this or yeah? Yes, you know much more about Australia than I do, but so, uh, for the ag economists or the economists in the room, um, you know, the, the costs of putting in that process, uh, the 
Um, the transaction costs, that is the, the public money that goes into putting that in place, are just going at exactly the same. The rate of saving of water, whatever you're talking about, is exactly matched by the cost of, um, the, of the public purse of getting these things in place. But it is the perception. Good, we had one question here. If we can get a mic. Then we had one up there, and then we have one there. Hello there, Barbara Frost from WaterAid. Uh, we're an NGO focused on people without access to safe water, the 800 million people, and people without access to safe sanitation, the 2.5 billion people. Um, I'd say we are optimists. We believe there's solutions. We see what's been achieved over the last hundred years. We believe that can be done if there is political will, if the private sector, the public sector and uh, civil society work effectively together. Um, and we're really interested in seeing what possibilities there are for that. The, um, one of the things that really struck me, the panel talked about the interconnectedness of health, of livelihoods, of water, sanitation, food security, human rights, the environment. We are going into a period where the MDGs are being reviewed, the Millennium Development Goals, and there's discussion on what that should be going forward. I'd be very interested to hear the panel's views, because on one level I think we all acknowledge that the focus on particular areas that need attention to alleviate poverty has really mobilised the world. The downside has been that it's perhaps at times been at the expense of the interrelatedness and the need for systemic change. So I'd be very interested in your views on that. Thank you. Who wants to pick this up first? Johan? <clears throat> just thank that. That's a very important question and, and which was raised just to complement the intro here in, in, at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. And as you may be aware, Ban Ki-moon has now set up a a commission led by, by David Cameron, the Swedish Minister for Development Cooperation is, is on this commission to address exactly this question. Signals are, and I'm very happy about that, that they're going to uh, do exactly what Colin put in his concluding remark, that we need smart policy must be based on good science, and uh, that's at least what, uh, what they're set out to do. And I think today we could easily say that science has enough evidence to help leaders in the world to put quantitative global sustainability targets. The MDGs were really good up until the seventh goal, which was all this mishmash of good words, but no quantifications, neither on sanitation, nor on water, nor on, envir on environmental sustainability. I think we simply have to push for quantitative goals so that we can start, you know, in a way, steer leadership towards something like a safe operating space for humanity. And, and the journey there will then be very tough, but it at least gives us an accounting rule because one of the dilemmas, of course, is that what we don't measure, we don't manage. And I think that's very clear as, as, a, as an experience. But it's just to say that science, I think, is ready for that challenge. And, and one of them should, of course, be sanitation. But I think another goal should also be uh, probably stratified goals at different scales regarding sustainable management of freshwater. I would very much like to see a coordination effort, essentially a campaign, a military campaign, if you will, approach. Um, with the, There are just hundreds of organizations, now I'm speaking from the health sanitation perspective, there are hundreds of organizations that are doing good, but if all of them could be somehow coordinated so that, uh, as we attempted with the kiosk study to determine the range which we can reach with a given kiosk and then placing them and empowering the individual communities, we could essentially cover an entire country. And it could be done uh, collaboratively and cooperatively. Uh, to me, it seems uh, uh, almost a given if we could somehow do the coordination. In a way, we could, as we've been talking about, using water for better crop production, I think we could provide safe water on a grand scale, a global scale, if we were able somehow to utilize science, modeling, networking theory, and the kind of mathematical approach that would allow us to develop a genuine global campaign 
integrating the many, many units of effort that are now actually in place. So a business, Paul, do you want to comment as well? Uh, yeah. We all, uh, I'm an optimist, so uh, that's my starting point, but we all are Cartesian minds. So we want to here in this room see and define very well the problem and have an answer before we get out of the room here. And there is no such thing as one answer. And, 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 and that's a little bit, uh, I feel the inspiration of the development goals was to frame a little bit uh, uh, and give a direction so that then a lot of energy of many, many players can go in an aligned way, but it should not all be intertwined. And, and there's a Chinese proverb, I mentioned it uh, over, over, over uh, during the coffee break, but there is a Chinese proverb that says, choose the right direction, start walking, don't stop and you have a good chance of getting there. And there's so much happening already. And I do feel, uh, uh, as a company, there is so much more openness now for uh, all s parts of society to work together much more, much more than 10 years ago. Uh, we are interrelating with many, many uh, dimensions of society now in a much uh, permanent way. So there is lots of energy going in the right direction. Uh, so what we have to do is to, to, to make sure that the efficiency of the efforts is, and the effectiveness of the efforts is increased. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, what can a company like Nestle do and bring? Well, we do have, uh, as I mentioned, many factories in the world, and normally a factory is there for quite a while, so there's a, uh, there is a continuity there that can be interlinked with uh, some other efforts, normally NGOs and all that, that do have the limitation of uh, not keeping going in the same place on, uh, for long we can bring that. So there's lots of uh, positive uh, elements coming into the equation that I do feel are converging somewhere. Um, so I, I, I would just say that, that let that energy flow now in, 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 in that direction, start linking more up, coordinate better, go for effectiveness. But there's lots of things happening. There's lots of things happening. So smart objectives to the MDGs and more collaboration. We have... Um, Seven minutes left, so we have a few more questions. There's, yes, up here, fourth road from the up, and I might be able to take one more from there as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kevin Paris from OECD. I very much enjoyed the presentations. They were very stimulating. Um, my question is that uh, I, I tend to feel that the focus this morning has been very much on the supply side and not much on the demand side. And um, one thing you have seen in changes of agricultural commodity prices um, is that the uh, upward movement is very much demand driven whereas we had when we had uh, high, higher uh, commodity prices in the past these were largely supply driven like we had in the 70s now as part of that demand drive you've also should seeing now a change of diet uh, because people in china india indonesia brazil these countries as people become more affluent they're eating they're drinking more milkshakes eating more hamburgers drinking more coca-cola and all the rest of it and uh, which is maybe a good thing but of course that is creating pressures on the environment and you see a very good example of this in the case of new zealand as dairy prices are going up the cow numbers are going up and they now have incredible water problems both not only of the amount of water but the pollution of it and that's another aspect which i think is being overlooked here is that the sheer cost of pollution in a publication i've just been involved with at oecd we estimate millions of dollars or billions of dollars annually in cost of cleaning up water so we can drink it as a result of farming so i'll be interested to hear from the panel about what the implications or how you see the future particularly looking at the demand side not, not just producing enough food for everybody but where you get that demand shift in the type of food and products that uh, um, we're going to be consuming if, if, we, if patterns continue as normal. Thank you. So the change in demand and the cost of pollution. Rita. As a molecular biologist, biotechnologist, uh, you've given me an opportunity to ride my hobby horse. I think the way we handle um, sewage uh, waste, both industrial and domestic waste treatment, is um, insanity. We could be utilizing those wastes in a very productive way to um, create energy and to provide uh, absolutely safe, recyclable water. Uh, if we would just use the kind of fermentation technology that we're developing uh, scientifically in the laboratories today for production of pharmaceuticals, for example, uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, uh, treat their waste much more carefully than we treat the waste that we uh, then recycle into our streams because they recover the very valuable uh, leakage 
of uh, their products. So I, I think uh, we really do need to modernize and put into the 21st century the mechanisms by which we do our um, waste treatment. Colin. I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I think Kevin's framed the issue very well, and uh, I could put in a plug here for the CGIR. We've just set up a new program called Water, Land and Ecosystems, and one of our key uh, modules or themes in that is resource reuse and recovery. And it's not only sort of, uh, we need to change the paradigms again. We can't put in very sophisticated uh, European or North American style treatment plants. We need to sort of leapfrog the technology into some of the simple things that are available and some of the exciting things on the horizons. But the other thing we need to do, and this is what we're really focusing on, is start to build an entrepreneurial spirit in this area of uh, waste recovery so we can get small businesses set up who are treating the water, taking the solids, getting it out as fertiliser. And we think there's phenomenal scope there. And uh, it's small beginnings. And again, um, we're getting a little bit of support. Very, We're very pleased to get some support from the Gates Foundation on, on this. So it's a real exciting, challenging area. And Paul. Could you, as a, as, a, as a company, could you uh, in influence the consumer? They're not just only influencing you, but you're also influencing their demand side of things. Well, yes. Uh, I, I spoke about that already in the sense that uh, education, again, uh, it is clear that if the world, the emerging markets, 80% of the world population, if they would adapt and uh, copy, uh, for example, the American lifestyle, we are, we, 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 on energy, definitely, but also on food, we would be in diets and then also the non-communicable diseases and all that, that would explode. And actually it is exploding already in many parts of the world. So uh, I do believe that, that, first of all, as an industry too, and I mentioned more good is in, less bad and bad is out, uh, definitely we have to do a job there. If we speak about low calorie, it should be no calorie maybe. Although some people, they need calories too. But uh, so it is, uh, and the science is there. And the sci so we're investing heavily in science to do that, to bring, because you have food, and eating is about also enjoying. Uh, let, let's face it, we have dinners together, we talk, and so you should keep that. And, and, but, but there's so much science that can be brought in there to do that in a much more responsible, nutrient-dimensional way. So that's something we, we, we have to commit to as an industry, and, I, and, and that's why we invest quite heavily in, in, in the research and development there. Uh, then education, and I mentioned that, uh, because there is so much, in our society, some, and that's another point, in our society, um, uh, in the developed world, we have taken away the self-responsibility of people. If you think about it, whatever happens to some individual, it is uh, somewhere uh, framed politically as you should blame somebody. And, and self-responsibility, I do believe, come, should come back. The developing world is developing there uh, now. We should bring that there too, the self-responsibility, not going in our direction and then to go back also in our world the self-responsibility should go back. How do you do that? Education again, and then uh, 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 relationships. We are interrelated with our consumers in a much more deeper way, and we don't have communication, we have really interchange off. So engage much more there too. So I do believe we have a, a, a social role to play here. And actually then uh, also disengage from products that you don't want to engage in. And that's why we are very, very heavily in water. Because if you want to save water, drink water. And, and these things are uh, driving our agenda as a company. We want to be a company, not food and beverage. We want to be a company that drives and brings and allows uh, people to have healthy diets, nutrition, health and wellness. And that's a promise. And that uh, entails lots of consequences, investment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and backing off of certain products. And that is what we do. Thank you. I think, unfortunately, we'll have the last question here. Uh, you have the mic already. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Aditi Mukherjee. I'm a senior social, social scientist at the International Water Management Institute. And as Colin mentioned in the inaugural uh, session, I'm also the winner of this year's Norman Borlaug Award for Field Research. Uh, this is a new award that they have started for people under 40. Um, uh, so, uh, so there are a number of points. I've been listening to all the discussions, very, very important discussions. And I thought I'll put forward a few points. Like we keep hearing about 7 billion population and that going up to 9 billion. And I think what we should be more looking into is not population, but per capita consumption of that population. 
population. And the moment we start looking at per capita consumptions, this focus on developing countries squarely shifts to the focus on developed countries. I mean, I'll give you an example on energy on which I work a lot. I mean, uh, per capita consumption of energy in India is around 300 kilowatt hours per capita. And here people are looking for such basic things as electricity for lighting and, you know, a fan. While we know per capita consumption of electricity can be as high as 6,000 and more, and there we hear that due to fiscal deficits, uh, I have been reading that Americans can no longer use their clothes dryer, and that's a big you know, discomfort, but I'll be like, please get real. I mean, there are people who need electricity just you know, to survive. So please don't look at population alone, look at population per capita consumption, and that is why CV's message on, on uh, reducing waste is so, so, so important. Um, I also want to say that poor farmers throughout the developing world, Africa, India, have very, very, very legitimate aspirations. They want to send their children to school and, and there is no way by listening that there would be you know, over explosion of population and there would be a lot of consumption. They are not going to change their aspirations. And we as scientists have obligation towards those people in the poor countries. So removing hunger and poverty should and must remain our main goal and should not we should not in my opinion get diverted from that by this talk about population i keep going back look at per capita consumption and i see a lot of that reflected among even the panelists uh, so and finally is also in my opinion talking of the best textbook solutions do not help in the context of the developing world pricing water is is really not the solution because as tony says and tony was my external examiner for my phd he, <laughs> <laughs> he did not fail me. So as, as, as Tony says very clearly that we live in political economies. So pricing water may not be the solution, but you do have second best solutions. And India has been trying a lot of them. Second best solutions like you could ration electricity instead of really pricing it and metering it because metering reads, meets with political resistance, but rationing does not. Also coming to food waste, one of the reasons when I was a student at Cambridge, I would buy this uh, yogurt in bulk, like they come in 12 packs. While I wanted to buy one pack of yogurt in the supermarkets, I never have the option. I buy this 12 packs of yogurt, all of different flavor, and I'm like bored. Oh my God, I can't eat yogurt every day. <laughs> and that's how, so, so India does that. India and many of the developing countries really packages things small. And that's because people don't have the buying power to buy things in bulk. So we have to think. And now it's time to also learn from innovations in that's happening in the developing world. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations on your award. Uh, any last comments from, from the panel on, on these comments or, or on any other issues? Thank you very much.